Yep. Yep. Good afternoon, Alex. Scott? Hey, buddy. Here. <clears throat> Waters? Here. Gretkin? Here. Moore? Here. Shaner? Here. Can we stand for a moment of silent prayer followed by the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the United States of America. and to the republic, the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, a nation under God. Visible. liberty and justice for all. Okay, we're back the same way if the audience in uh, watching on TV or on the computer wants to phone in the number 712-224-4996. Consent agenda is items two through 12. Consider them to pass unanimously unless a separate roll call votes asked for by a council member. <clears throat> Phone in, please uh, state the item you're speaking on and limit your comments to three minutes. We'll also need your name and address for the record. Uh, I'll move the consent agenda. Second. Two is a reading of the city council minutes of May 11, 2020. Three is a resolution approving the West 7th Street Corridor Facade Improvement Program funding. I want to, for the record, uh, I used to own one of these buildings. I no longer own any property on West 7th, and I am not participating in any of the rehab that they're proposing. I don't even know what their plan is. Number four is a resolution authorizing final payment to KP Construction for the 10th and Irene Streets Paving Repair Project. Five are actions relating to grants. A is a resolution accepting a grant agreement from the FAA under the CARES Act for the airport. Mayor, I've got a question on this one. Uh, Bob, is Mike available? Yes. Is that a yes? Yes, it is. Here it is. Okay. Mike, yeah. is, it, is this a new grant different from the prior grant that we had? We've never, Mike Collette, Assistant City Manager, we have not had this grant ever in the past. This is the first time for this based on the legislation uh, approved by the Congress. What, what do we have? Well, maybe I'm thinking of the same thing. That was an application that came to council for approval to apply. That was the application, okay. Yeah. And this is just, this is for the operations? Yes. Not and the capital, not any capital operations. expenditures. Yes. But the for the loss of revenue that we might experience because of the landing fees and that. Anything after January 20th. January 20th, and is there a job, is there a job or employment level that has to be maintained? We do, we have to maintain employment as of March 27th and we'll file on a quarterly basis to uh, basically prove that number throughout. I, I'm not sure how far in the future that will go. This uh, particular grant doesn't really have a cap as far as the length and it's 100% funded by the federal government. It is 100%. I thought I read something to the effect of four years, Mike. They, they, essentially it is four years, but they, they know that this is new for everybody, so if it's not for some reason used up in four years, they will work with us to extend that period out. Four years is amazing. Right, it is a long time. I, I can't imagine we won't use it in the very near future. Okay. Yes, I would imagine as well. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. B is a resolution accepting a transit joint participa participation agreement with the IDOT for the two heavy duty buses. C is a resolution authorizing an application for the coronavirus emergency funding grant for construction of the vestibule waiting area to screen visitors to the police headquarters. D is a resolution authorizing the police department to accept a grant from the IDPS for overtime hours, education and training. E is a resolution authorizing Sioux City Community Assistance to apply for and receive a Sioux Land Recovery Fund grant from the United Way. Six are actions relating to bonds. A is a resolution directing the sale of GO Bond Series 2020A. Uh, B is a resolution directing sale of GO Bond Series 2020B. Did you guys get the memo on the interest rate? It was extremely favorable yeah. for the city. Yes, very good. Okay, seven are actions relating to agreements and contracts. A is a resolution approving an amendment to number one to the contract with Bruning Eye Specialists and IEDA. 
B is a resolution approving change order number two to contract with Mark Albanicius for the phase three emergency utility pavement repair project. C is a resolution awarding a service provider agreement to Coughlin Landscaping for the Sioux Landscaping Project at the airport. D is a resolution approving a contract with Knife River for the annual resurfacing project phase one. I have a question on that one, Mayor. Mm -hmm. is, is Gordon available, Bob? Yes, Gordon is on his way up. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yes, Gordon's there. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. You can help me with that. I can hear better. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, I've had people yelling at me all day, so that's my excuse. Um, Gordon, so the annual resurfacing project, what, when does that start? Uh, we hope to have that started here within by June 1st at late start date. And, and how long a project is that, Gordon? Uh, the first phase will be... Hamilton from 7th to Wesley, and that's 30 working days. Uh, they'll be working six days a week. And then the next couple of phases is either on Jackson or on 30th, and that's 80 working days. 80? Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. So they are going to get done this year as opposed to last year when we had a bunch of carryover. Can't guarantee that at this point, but I'm hoping so, yes. Well, if you start in July, there's no excuse not to. That's correct. Okay. He is a resolution approving a two-year extension with Piper Jaffray and Company for financial advisory services. When will we ever bid it, Bob? You guys, once you get in here, you never... If we rebid this about four years ago, this is, is an extension with the changeover from finance directors and shortage of staff, we are requesting that this be extended once. For two years? Yes, for two years. Yeah, once for two years, that's not once. But, so make a note of that, would you? F is a resolution proposing to amend the lease with the Missouri River Boat Club for 1085 Council Oak Drive. G has a resolution awarding a service provider agreement to McConnell and Associates for the Riverside Courts resurfacing project. I'm amazed that one of the largest people I think that does this work is Dennis in Iowa and they didn't bid. So I wonder how or why our way of notifying contractors is not working. Because they do a lot of these tennis courts, Midwest track and turf and they do a lot of football fields and I'm amazed that they did not bid this unless it's too small for them but could, could you have Matt ask them why they didn't bid? No but I, I can find out. Yeah I'd like to know why they didn't bid because Midwest, turf. Midwest track, and turf. track and turf out of Dennison. Right there. What's that? Matt is here. Yeah why wouldn't they have bid that Matt? I mean, that's what they do. Yeah, Matt Salvatore, Parks and Recreation Director. We sent it, we sent it out to everybody. All the, a lot of them are, are just busy this time of year. Okay. All right. H is a resolution. You sent it to them for sure? We sent it to all the local vendors that we have, that we had contacts for through purchasing. So I'm pretty sure we did. Well, was it, would you check that? Was it, which company? There are three, three companies that. Midwest Track and Turf. Okay, I'll check on Out that. Out of Denison. I'll check on that. H is a resolution awarding a consulting services agreement to Locks and Swartz for fee accounting services and the housing choice voucher program. I have no idea. Read that memo about three times. Still don't understand what they're possibly doing for us for that small of an amount, but it sounds like it's something we have to have. I is a resolution approving a contract with KP Construction for the Emergency Utility Pavement Repair Project Phase 5. Eight are actions I have, a, I have a question on Mayor on I, or just maybe a comment, but Gordon, are you still there? Yes. This is an emergency repair project, so if you've noticed in the write-up that Gordon submitted, I think the other low bid was six weeks out before they could even get to the job. Isn't that Correct? Right. Yes, that's correct. So I just want you all to know, I mean, so we're paying somewhat of a premium to have the emergency repair made now rather than six weeks from now. 
Well, that's for yes. because you high-end guys have to have Starbucks. And Gordon, what what is their start date on this? Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago, and they're actually going to be done tomorrow. Yeah, it's paid. Judy. Okay, great. So it's yeah. really their completion date. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah that's I did notice that we were paying a little more because of that. It's the one right by Thank Starbucks. You, Gordon. When you get your morning latte, you could have seen them working out there. Yeah. <laughs> I can't go that way. <laughs> I did drive on that glass-like surface on Stone Park Boulevard, though. Yeah. Eight are actions relating to personnel. A is the resolution amending the position classification manual by approving an updated job description for the technical clerk position. B is a resolution amending this community development payroll complement by adding two project coordinator positions and deleting one administrative secretary. C is a resolution approving a manual and salary schedule for police supervisory employees. D is a resolution approving a manual and salary schedule for fire supervisory employees. Nine are approval total payments issued for <clears throat> April 2020. Ten are applications for beer. I'm sorry, for cigarette, tobacco, nicotine, vapor permits. See the list. Do you have any questions? 11's applications for beer and liquor license. See the list. Come forward if you have any questions. And 12 is receipt of minutes. See the list. Come forward if you have any questions. Or anyone to be heard on that? Call the roll, please. Waters? Alex? Sorry. Aye. Sorry. Gretkin? Aye. Moore? Aye. Shaner? Aye. Scott? Aye. Hearings. 13 is a hearing and a resolution approving plans and specs for the taxiway A reconstruction project at the airport. I'll move that. Second. The hearing is now open. Would anyone like to be heard for or against the resolution? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Call the roll, please. Gretkin? Aye. Moore? Aye. Chainer? Aye. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. 14 is a hearing and resolution amending the budget for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020. I'll move that. Second. The hearing is now open. Would anyone like to be heard to speak for or against the <clears throat> item? Seeing none, the hearing is closed. Call the roll, please. Moore? Aye. Chainer? Aye. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Gretkin? Aye. 15 is an ordinance repealing Title 13 Sewers of the Municipal Code and acting a new title of the same name. I'll move first reading. Second. I have a question. We always, you're, you're looking for what kind of a rate increase? Uh, two and a half, I think I read it, something like that. What is it? Uh, Mayor and Council and Utility Director, uh, we can kind of walk through those. It depends right. upon the, the user class yeah. as to which. Right, I know there's like yeah. all kinds. Yep. And uh, I can get a presentation up here for you. Bear with me just a minute. Is this the PowerPoint that was sent out to us? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, thank you. Does everybody have that? Yep. Yes, sir. Okay. Before we get into the PowerPoint, just a couple of things, uh, Mayor and Council, uh, and then I'll ask Teresa to come up and talk about uh, the first part of the presentation. But uh, what we're asking you to do tonight is to consider uh, really an overhaul to Title 13, the sewer part of our ordinance. And uh, this is a, uh, something that's been worked on for uh, probably two or two and a half years at this point. We've had the help of legal many times. Uh, we've had input from a variety of uh, industrial users, sister cities, stakeholders. Um, and we're, we're at this point where we're ready to ask you to consider adopting this. Um, this does become the basis for our industrial pretreatment program and for our sister city agreements, and it establishes user charges. It does include recommended rate adjustments, which Teresa and I will summarize for you in just a minute. 
Um, the new ordinance is based upon the EPA model uh, and it adopts allowed industrial loadings, which allocates, which can be allocated as limits in industrial user permits if needed. This has been vetted many times over by stakeholders and we've incorporated those comments uh, in what we've done here. Councilman Gretkin has been involved uh, Mark, this has also been reviewed by State IDNR and EPA yes. as well, right? Yes. Yep. Councilman Gretkin and uh, Capron have been involved uh, over the past couple of years as well. Um, and DNR continues to vet this, uh, and they're just waiting on, on our actions at this point. Um, we do intend to have a additional stakeholders meeting on June 1st, which we assume would be when you would be doing the second reading on this ordinance, uh, and we've already scheduled that with uh, the stakeholders, industrial users, and sister cities, and we intend to go through it one more time with them, uh, informing them what the changes are, answering any questions that they have, and making sure that they're completely up to speed. Uh, it does enable the city to better address capacity limitations. It allows us to maximize and optimize allocations to not exceed assigned capacities while being as impartial as possible and considering all current stakeholders. It does include fats, oils, and grease limits for industrial users while maintaining them for the food service establishments. The new code uh, adopts a TKN, total Keldahl nitrogen rate, along with allowable industrial load mentioned earlier. Uh, TKN is one of the most problematic uh, pollutants that we have in our wastewater. And in the last four months, we've been within 5% of our allowable load for TKN. So it is a very important parameter for us to be considering. Uh, the proposed TKN rate will allow the city to recover some of the cost of treating waste with high levels of TKN. And we'd like you to note that the typical domestic strength for TKN is in the 30 milligram per liter range. What we have proposed in this ordinance is to not start uh, any type of uh, rates or enforcement action until we reach the 100 milligram per liter. So it's literally three times. We wanna kind of phase this in uh, and be easy on the industries as we possibly can. And this has also been discussed with the most impacted industrial users and simulated bills have been provided. Um, we will update this and provide it once again to these users if they desire. Ideally, the revenue from the surcharge would go towards funding a collaborative solution for TKN treatment. The TKN rate would be phased in over three years when it is reached and the level rec recommended by the cost of service study as our true cost of service. We also are well underway with grant funded pilot studies that may, may reduce nitrogen and we'll do a second study which should give us needed information on methods to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus for the near future. Both may be mandated as early as our next NPDES permit, uh, which we're waiting to receive now. It gives us flexibility on this, in the sense that we are required to meet federal requirements but enables us to optimize our industrial pretreatment program so our limited resources are best utilized to protect the publicly owned treatment works while allowing as much flexibility as possible to all stakeholders. One example of this is five-year permit cycles and uh, that used to be a three-year cycle so it actually gives more flexibility, more time for the city and for industries than we've had in the past and there are many other examples I won't take the time to go through now. Uh, it improves our enforcement response plan and provides more clarity to stakeholders. The rates that we're proposing are heavily influenced by the cost of service study as well as a fund analysis uh, to maintain our debt, co debt coverage ratios and uh, compliance with SRF requirements. Uh, so that's kind of a summary of what we're asking you to look at tonight. And it is very significant, so I wanted to take a little bit more time than normal. Uh, it's probably one of the larger things that we've done in the last several years for the wastewater treatment system. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Teresa to kind of walk through. Mark, Mark before you do that, yes. could I just 
uh, for purposes of getting Julie caught up. Um, Julie, the, Mark mentioned that cost of service study that was done, and the council ap approved that with a consulting service agreement with HDR in November of 2018. And then okay. the council approved that cost of service study on, on, uh, in June of 2019. So uh, like Mark had said, a lot of input went into this. And one of the really strong bases that we're relying on is this cost of service study. So mm -hmm. it's not like it's just a sudden deal that's come up or it's an overnight deal. It's been one that's been studied for a couple of years. So I just yes, it, it, uh, May of 18, I believe. Was that right? Back in May? I mean, back in 2018? It may have been well, even was, sooner than that, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I just, and, and my understanding, Mark, just to piggyback off of that comment with Dan too, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was a lot of the other industries and um, I think even the sister cities were urging for that study as well to have a better understanding of what those accurate costs would be, right? That's correct. They were urging that as well. It was not just our, our wanting of the study. Right. Yes, they, they uh, had requested it. Uh, and so they were active participants in selection of HDR as well as uh, the scope of the proposal and trying to determine if it met our scope once we received those proposals. So. And Mark, you also mentioned you'll be meeting with the Sister City Industries on June 1. Yes, sir. Will you we be having, I mean, you'll, you'll have ongoing, I would think, conversations with them about all of this, wouldn't you, as you go forward? Yes, sir. Each one's a little bit different, but uh, certainly various levels of staff are engaged with the uh, industries. I'm engaged quite a bit with the sister cities when, uh, when they reach out. Uh, so I think that we're covering those bases, but we'd be welcome to, we welcome your input as to how much more we might do in that regard. Okay, thank you. Mayor and Council, Teresa Fitch, Interim Finance Director. Um, I'm gonna go over the first portion of the um, sewer rates, kind of the overall fund analysis, and um, Mark will talk more in detail about the actual rates to each industry. Um, <coughs> slide here, you'll see, um, this just is a recap of all the capital projects. It's really just an overall, overall you'll see a lot of annual um, types of sewer um, projects as well as other Im improvements to the sewer. Um, it, you'll see the total cost. Um, in that 21 year, which is this current year, is 17 million. In 22, it's 11 million, and in 23, seven, another 7 million. Um, those are the years that we're looking at here. Okay, I'm going to move to the next slide, the third slide, for those of you at home following along. Um, this here is just an overall um, summary of the actual and um, fund analysis. Um, if, as you can see. Um, Looks like without an increase, um, soon in 24, um, our um, fund will go negative. Um, we will no longer um, have the required fund balance that, that our fund policy requires. Um, with this increase, um, we will gradually get to our 20% um, fund balance requirement. Um, our actual policy says between 12 and 20%. Um, also without this increase, which isn't shown here, but um, we, um, we would not have enough coverage for our debt ratio. So in 21, um, our debt ratio would be, uh, would be um, 113%, um, 22 would be 114%, and then 23 would be 110%. It is required to be at 110% for SF, SRF funding. So um, we really do need um, an increase to ensure that we can get our funding for the SRF loans. Um, this fund analysis, I'm gonna move to the next slide here. Um, this will um, just summarize some of the assumptions within the fund analysis. Uh, the renewable fuel um, revenue, uh, this, this here lays out and is um, you know, done by Mark's group and um, a, lo a lot of work is put into determining what we anticipate the revenues to be. Um, that's the revenue layout for um, the actual renewable fuel revenue. Um, in addition to that, um, there is within the um, Fund analysis, we've estimated um, a collection of a um, outstanding receivable of $1.55 million. Um, so that is also included in the sewer fund analysis. Teresa? 
Yes. Could I, could I ask you a question on that, please? Sure. The slide I'm looking at says if more is recovered, this could reduce the rate increase needed in future fiscal years. Correct. How, how do we track that? So, in other words, how would I know five years from now that we've recovered or more was recovered than we, than we anticipated in 2020 and so we could start to reduce our rate increases? What, what triggers that and who oversees that? Um, right now, I know Mark and Legal are um, actively monitoring this um, receivable. It is one large receivable. Um, so I, I do think that they'll, they are tracking it and monitoring it closely. Um, and we would have a, I mean, I don't know a timeline. Do you know Mark on a timeline? Nicole might be better. <laughs> Mark, do you know Nicole? Do you have a timeline of any? This is a potential litigation item. So that's kind of. Okay. Okay. So at this point, we don't have a timeline. Okay. Um, but that'd be a recovery that we'd all be made aware of anyway, so. Yes. But, but I just hope, I hope I connect the dots to say, oh gosh, we've recovered this, now we can look at our rates again. Right, no, the council will be notified of the recovery. And we'll be, I, I believe, fully involved in that process. Okay, thanks. So, Teresa, this is yes. Julie. I just wanted to ask on that point, too. The $3.1 million outstanding on that slide, that's the goal that if we recover the entire 3.5, then we can maybe level off increases? Yes, if we, if we recover the full 3.1, yes. Um, but right now, we are just anticipating 50%, so um, just to be conservative. Mm -hmm. this, that fund analysis only includes 50% of that receivable. Okay, understood. I'm moving to the next slide. Um, we'll discuss the residential um, user impact. Um, the, and there'll be three slides here. Um, each one of them will um, discuss a different um, type of user. Um, each one of them, again, see the 4.5% increase in 21, 22, and 23, um, all residential. The first user you see here is a a low volume person typically or people's one to two people in a household um, they would consume 50 to 100 gallons per day per person um, overall of, of the three years they would see an increase of a total of two point uh, two dollars and 78 cents over the three years of their their monthly increase so at the end of the three years they would have a two dollar and 78 cent increase in their monthly bill uh, the second user, which is on to the next slide, kind of a typical user, which we would be two to four people in a household. Um, again, 50 to 100 gallons um, usage per person. Um, the monthly increase in um, 21 would be $1.65, um, 22, $1.72, and 23, $1.80. So in overall, um, in the three years, they'd see in a monthly increase $5.17 at the end of that three-year period per month. The next, the next family you'll look at is a large family, four to eight people in the household, same usage of gallons of water. Um, they would see an overall over the three years, $9.95 of increase at the end of the three year period. The next slide. Very reasonable. The next slide here will just um, give you a rate comparison compared to other cities in Iowa. Um, right now we are um, fifth. Um, for rates. Um, with this increase, you'll see where we have um, the current and the new. We will still remain fifth ranked in the state. Um, you know, we're not far off from other, the other, um, other cities here. And now I will turn this over to Mark, and he'll talk to you more about the industrial users. Thank you, Teresa. Mayor and Council, Mark Sims, Utilities Director, uh, back up again. And uh, still uh, on those last two slides, just to kind of mention, um, you know, what does it really cost a user to put a gallon of waste or wastewater down the drain? And believe it or not, it, it, it amounts to six tenths of one cent uh, is what they uh, would be doing if these rates go into place. And in the year, the fiscal year, third fiscal year, uh, 
it would go up to seven tenths of one cent. Gives you an idea what it costs to, to be able to treat one, one gallon just to really bring it down to, you know, to that level. That's all well and good, but a person of five or six people, are, they're gonna spend a hundred and some dollars more a year. They sure are, yep. And the, uh, not everybody gets those kind of raises in town. Right. So if, um, uh, Teresa mentioned the rate comparison and what we have there, if you go back to that slide, uh, it would have been slide number seven. It had uh, the, the bar graph there. Uh, it has the current as well as the new rate, and we obviously don't know yet what the new rates are for these other communities. So we assume that we're gonna kind of stay on pace here with these rates in terms of uh, what our rates are, uh, you know, related to others in the state. So roughly continuing to be in fifth place. Uh, certainly there are many other considerations that we don't wanna take time here to go through, but you could evaluate every rate that we have against theirs. In some cases we're lower, some cases we're higher, depending on whether it's residential or industrial or whatever the case might be. Uh, if we jump ahead to slide number eight, uh, you'll see we're talking about industrial users now. And uh, again, we charge industrial users based upon several factors. The only one that I uh, took time to focus on in this presentation was their flow. Uh, and you can see that we're uh, requesting a 7.5% increase each of the three fiscal years. And you can kind of see the impact here. We have uh, roughly 33 industrial users. Um, I don't know, probably 20 of those or so are, are in Sioux City. Uh, and you can see what the flow charge is per thousand gallons. Um, and then I, just for the, the sake of giving you something to, to compare this to, uh, I said that a small user might use 60,000 gallons per month, uh, and that would certainly, that would be the equivalent of about 2,000 gallons per day. So you can see what the impact there is. It would be a monthly increase on that flow volume uh, of 1224 the first year and so forth. So that would be a small <coughs> user. A medium user, and again, these are not related to any specific industry, or just for uh, comparison purposes, but a medium user was, that was using about a half a million gallons per month, uh, you can see that their monthly increase in fiscal year 21 with the 7.5% would be $102, and then it goes to $109.50 and $117.50 over the next two fiscal years. So that's- Mark, I have a question. Yes. Could, I, could we get just a- uh and general idea of what kind of a business or industrial business would be qualify as a small user, just for an example? Uh, I would say the majority of ours are uh, probably in the small to medium category. Uh, I'll show you an example on the next slide of a large user and the impact there, um, but- What I, would the type of business be? Well, all these are food industries, Julie, so um, oh, okay. they're, they're all over the board. Okay, gotcha. Um, and if you have other questions, feel free to call me. I can give you specific I examples. You. Uh, and the next slide, uh, which would be slide number uh, 10, you can see where it says large user on the bottom right-hand side. This is using 50, 50 million gallons per month or the equivalent of about 1.67 million gallons per day. We have one user in this category in Sioux City. Um, we have other users outside of Sioux City that are a little bit less than this, but somewhat rival this number. And you can see the uh, impact here at a 7.5% per year increase. Fiscal year 21, it'd be a little over $10,000 a month increase and goes up to 11,750 in that third fiscal year. But that's 30 some thousand a month at the end of the rate increase. So you're talking 360,000, right? Yes. And, and keep in mind other, other parameters that are not gonna be shown on these slides, BOD, suspended solids, those types of things. 
uh, uh, those also have changes in their rates. Some of them uh, are influenced by the cost of service, but the cost of service was not uh, completely followed in that regard. So this uh, is a, probably a confusing slide for you. Um, the things in yellow are the things obviously I thought you might want to focus on. TSS is total suspended solids. That's the solid part of the waste. Uh, and you can see that, um, and what I've left off here is what we call domestic level waste. Uh, it's important to note that industries pay nothing for domestic level waste other than for their flow. Uh, there, there's zero charge to them for that. So once they reach a concentration in for example, with TSS of 301, then they go into this tier one category, and you can see what the rate is there uh, each year. If they go above uh, 1,200, for example, for TSS, then the rate essentially doubles, and I'm sure that when this was adopted years ago, the, the idea was to try and uh, limit how many industries uh, might have significant issues and send us, uh, you know, large amounts of waste that were difficult to handle. Uh, and so it was, it was kind of designed that way that that tier two was, was a pretty significant increase, in fact, a doubling. Um, you can see the very bottom there, TKN, that's that new charge. And uh, this is something that uh, was vetted quite a bit and talked about quite a bit at the uh, with HDR and with the uh, uh, cost of service study. Um, I can tell you for comparison purposes, I looked up the city of Ames uh, and they charge um, about 75% more than this for TKN. Um, they're at uh, point, um, I have to look that, I think it's, they're at a dollar one, I think is what it is, depending on what year you're looking at. So you can see what we're trying to do here is phase this in to have a little bit less impact. So the first year, uh, it would be a third of what uh, HDR had recommended that it needs to be in order to cover the cost of treating TKN. Uh, and TKN, again, is our most problematic um, constituent, I guess, in the waste. Most who, difficult what to industries? Treat. What industries are high in TKN? There are probably six or seven. Mayor um, Seaboard certainly would be one. Right. Um, if I remember right, Mobrin. Um, My point is that Ames can be whatever they want to because they don't have any industry like that to speak of. Right. They can. You're comparing apples and oranges. It was just the one example I looked up before I got up here, but I could yeah, certainly but I mean, they don't have try and provide that. more. They're, they're, they just don't have industrial users in that town to speak of. Right. Right. And then uh, outside domestic, or what you might think of as sister cities, is the next slide, and that is uh, slide number 12, I believe. Um, and you can see what I used there was an average of 30 million gallons per month, which is kind of in the middle of all of the sister cities. Uh, and you can see what the impact on those are. And I, I kind of refer you back to when we were talking with HDR about the cost of service study. Um, they, NF, they identified that uh, sister cities were being uh, severely undercharged and um, initially there was a recommendation uh, to make that up all in one year, and obviously we didn't do that, so this is kind of phasing that in. Uh, I have shared these rates. Uh, in fact, very similar scenarios as what you see here with the sister cities, um, and uh, that I believe I've gotten two comments back and there were no comments really, it was just an acknowledgement thank you for sending this uh, and we're aware of it. So I have had no feedback, I guess, positive or negative from the sister cities and they are aware. And again, we'll have them on a call uh, on June 1st 
um, and we'll be able to show these things to them on the screen. And then there are other fees that may not be uh, so significant to talk about, so I just lumped them all into one slide here, but there are fees for taking samples. Uh, each industry has a different type of sampling regimen. Uh, there are fees associated with the testing of that waste. Some require more testing than others. Uh, we have a, a rate that's been in place for some time for direct injection, which basically would be waste that's injected directly into our digesters where we can receive the most benefit from the gas. Um, there is some waste that's more beneficial than others, obviously. Uh, you can see that it, uh, it's going up at 2.25 if you approve this, and then septic haulers uh, has been, uh, I thought, was notoriously low for quite some time, but the cost of service actually turned out that we're not, not terribly far off in what we've been charging septic haulers as far as what it costs to treat their waste. Um, there are some other incidental charges I didn't think that we'd want to spend the time on today, but they are in the, in the code, uh, and I'm happy to share any of those with you at any of the readings if you'd like. And with that, that I think that uh, concludes the slide presentation. Questions, Council? Let me, let me just clarify something, Mark. Um, in your write-up, you had the Enterprise Fund Balance Policy, what it states with the 20%. Is that, in my understanding, that's what's driving some of this increase? Uh, there's two things, Councilman Moore. The, the, that policy, which uh, Teresa said is 12 to 20 percent. Um, so there's some flexibility there, as well as the uh, SRF requirement for 110 percent of our, you know, covering our debt. Uh, we can't maintain that uh, without the increase, so it would be difficult to continue many of the CIP projects that are going on uh, short of the increase. And the residential increases then, how, how many increases have we had? Uh, my notes showed that we had three, excuse me, two in the last eight years. I think this would be the third, potentially in the ninth year. And I, one thing I didn't focus on here, I assume you might get questions from the really small users, the one-person households, uh, the impact on them is about 51 cents a month uh, if they're a really low-volume user in the sense that they don't use more than uh, that 200 cubic feet. Okay. Thanks, Mark. I guess <clears throat> I would just ask Mark or Teresa. I mean, I think that the calculations, the debt capacity, all of those things can get convoluted and rather complicated, especially to just a constituent asking. I would just be curious, Mark, um, uh, you know, if, if posed to you, you got stopped in a grocery store and someone is asking you, which I know does not happen nearly as often in today's climate, but um, if someone stopped you and just asked, what's the 30-second response of why we have to do this? Why in the world are we having to increase the rate? Well, Alex, there's probably three things. Uh, first of all, as we know, that uh, just the general uh, costs go up from year to year, so there's going to be need, some need for additional revenue at some point. Um, what the cost of service identified was that we were <coughs> not charging for TKN, which is our most expensive component. And so HDR attempted to pull those costs out of some of the other rates like BOD and suspended solids, uh, and then make up for those with those that are contributing TKN. So the intent here of the cost of service certainly was to try and identify costs and then uh, make sure that the customer classes that were generating those costs were the ones that were going to pay for Let's be perfectly honest. The reason you've got TKN is because it's a state mandate. It got mandated because we're over nitrogen, our fields in Iowa, 
but rather than have the farmers have to do anything like shelter belts and those sort of things, the cities have to reduce. That's what it's all about. We put too much fertilizer on our yards in this city. We put too much fertilizer in the fields around our city. And if you know anything about it, this started about 10 years ago. It's the state's way of getting the nitrogen levels down in the state and having somebody besides the ag community pay for it. I'm not afraid to say that. If the farmers don't like it, too bad. It's reality. And you know it and I know it. And, and Mayor, State mandates on nitrogen is why you're doing this. And Mayor, phosphorus is another one that's on the horizon. Exactly. Uh, which is a, you know, a component of the fertilizer. We would have had to do this long before now if we wouldn't have put all that money in the sewer plant. And when we did that, the permit is a 10-year permit. Five-year permit used to be 10. When we started, I know it was because I remember eight years ago going to a league of cities and they told me we were okay for a while because we'd done all that work. Talking to one of the engineers that did a symposium. Anyway, long story short, guys, part of this is as a result of state mandates that you don't have any control over. So you got to pay for it. And we have significant food industries that generate a lot of uh, nitrogen. It's just part of their process. Um, and so we probably get hit harder than some other communities that don't have those types of industries. So, any other questions? Now that I'm on my soapbox, let's keep rolling here. <laughs> <laughs> Call the roll. Hmm. Janer? Aye. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Gretchen? Aye. Moore? Aye. 16, do we do 16 until we do the third reading? We would at any time, I think, Mayor. Okay, 16 is a resolution approving an enforcement response plan for pretreatment program at the wastewater treatment plant and rescinding resolution 2017 0142. I'll move it. Second. So we're voting on this one, number on 16? Yes. Yes. Okay, hey, Mark, just generally speaking, and you seldom, I hope you seldom hear this from me, but just looking through the enforcement response plan, that that is really a complicated, um, lengthy ordinance. Is, is there any way we can make that a little bit more simplified? Have somebody besides a lawyer write it, but probably not. <laughs> Actually, we had a consultant write it, which probably didn't. <laughs> well, right there. There. I'm sure you had an attorney on staff, but anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, so enforcement is going to be from you, Mark? Yes, from the utilities department. Okay. I mean, and, and I'm a little bit out of my area for sure of what I study, but I, when I was just reading through it, I just thought, wow. I mean, this is a... They do it now, Dan. What? They do it now. They already do this. It's just cleaning well, up is, the well, order. Right. What they're doing, this is what they've put in hiding. I, I, it may be okay. I mean, Mark, if you understand it and your department understands it, yes, sir, I'd have to read it again and again just, you know, just to see what the enforcement is because you're talking, if I read this correctly, I mean, you could be talking, what, $1,000 a day penalties? That's the maximum per violation. But that's, that's existed for quite some time, Dan. Uh, the, the penalty amounts really haven't changed. Uh, and this is something that uh, EPA, I think, wanted to see us shore up a little bit. They didn't feel like our existing enforcement response plan, which uh, you approved, I don't know, three or four years ago, 2017. Uh, was quite enough. When they would come and do the audits, they said, you know, you're missing this or you're missing that in terms of being able to enforce uh, your, your Title 13. Okay, I, I didn't know we were a little bit deficient then because, I mean, that was a consultant that worked on that back then, wasn't it? Or did no. we do that internally? That was, Councilman Moore, uh, this is Nicole, that was internally done, I believe, uh, several years that was ago. Probably, oh, okay. Yeah. I think it was done you internally. Made, you might have made that clear in the write-up, and I might have missed it. I was hung up on just reading through all of those pages again. So 
that answers my question. Thanks, Mark. I, Dan, I think that it gives us the it gives us the clarity we need that we were kind of missing. So I'm very comfortable with it. I know it's lengthy and probably the uh, non wastewater reader. It is complicated, but it does help us. Well, if it helps with enforcement too, that's important. Right. Okay. Thank you. Got a motion? Uh, yes, we do. Call the roll. Scott. Aye. Waters. Aye. Brecken. Aye. Moore. Aye. Janer. Julie. Julie. We'll move on. I, I'm, I'm, hello, I'm talking. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Yeah. We couldn't oh. hear you just oh, a, yeah. minute, a minute ago. I think my phone was cutting out. I kept saying, I, I. <laughs> I, I, I. Okay. I, 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 I. Oh, yeah, but a minute ago you were completely silent. Oh, my gosh. Okay. All right. 17 is a resolution approving a development agreement with Plaza Bullet 3091 Hamilton Boulevard. I'll move that. Second. Contrary to what? Some people think we're not putting $750,000 in this. It's a brownfield fund that no. we've had around that we have to spend on different projects like this. And so it's to help that building modernize and bring it up to date. So it's not what has been reported in the news media. Call the roll, please. And it's to help the abatement of the asbestos, is exactly. that correct? Exactly. That needs to be done. Yeah. And if I could make a humble request, Speaking of updating that facility, if we're going to be putting these funds towards and stuff, if we could make it more accessible, I would really appreciate that because there's no way to get down to the lanes to whether anyone with a mobility impairment would be able to bowl themselves or even just kind of hang out with their friends that are bowling there. It's I'm guessing they'll have at this time. If they're going to do enough work that they'll have, good to bring, point. have to bring it up to standards, Alex, would be my guess, like every other place. I would say so. And a point that I would like to make on the Plaza Bowl is that um, they have to have at least 16 lanes to have any kind of a um, tournament there right. in town. And that's the only bowling alley other than Lamar's in our vicinity that has 16 lanes or more. Okay. It sounds like it's going to be an extensive project because if I read it correctly, it doesn't get completed till the end of 20. Right. 20 Two. They promise it will be done by 2021, 21, but they I mean, think yeah, most 20, of the work will be finished by 2020, I think it says. Right. 2021 is when it's done. Yeah. Okay. okay, call the roll. Waters? Aye. Brecken? Aye. Moore? Aye. Daner? Aye. Scott? Aye. 18 is a resolution approving a contract to W.A. Klinger for the Chris Larson Park Riverfront Development Project. Somebody want to move that? I'll move it. Second. Oops, I'm sorry. Questions? Anybody got any questions? Because Matt's here if you do. Okay, call the roll. Is that Mayor, is anybody calling in? No. Okay. Okay, call. Matt the roll. answered all my questions earlier today. So. Okay. Brecken? Good. Aye. Moore? Aye. Daner? Aye. Scott? I'm going to abstain and not because I have a conflict of interest, but I'm, I'm not, I don't want to practice law, but I have concerns that this is an unbalanced bid. And for, I'm not, I don't want to, so rather than vote no, I don't want to question the legal department's opinion, but I, I just have reservations about it. So is that proper to abstain under that scenario? Um, it will count as a no vote on an abstention I, I without a conflict that. of interest, yes. An abstention always is a no vote. Would you like additional explanation from engineering regarding the analysis on the unbalanced no, they, question? No, they put it out there. I don't okay. agree with it. I'm, I'm you. Because if you have an item that you have a high dollar amount compared to the other bidders, that bidder has the potential to profit from a quantity change of any dramatic. And if, I mean, that's what an unbalanced bid is. You try to outguess the engineer of where you're going to have the overage. 
and I hope they're, I hope your engineering firm did a great job because if that particular item comes in way under, you guys are going to have a lot of egg on your face. I hate to tell you that. So anyway, it passes. Does everybody vote or go ahead? Waters? Aye. Okay. <clears throat> 19 is a resolution approving amendment number seven to the consulting services agreement with Smith Group for the Chris Larson Park Riverfront Development Project. Uh, somebody again will have to make a motion because I'm still not convinced. I'll just tell you why I don't want to make the motion because I'm not going to vote for this today. I'm not convinced of the, the great feature that's going to draw people off the interstate. I still haven't seen it and we're just, by doing this, we're moving ahead with that. We're going to accept what they say is the, is the agreement. And you can tell me not, Matt, but I know I've been here too long. Once we do these agreements. Matt Salvatore, Parks and Recreation Director. The scope of the design for phase two actually does not even include the iconic feature. Amendment number eight, was also, which is also being discussed today, is uh, for the discussion of the, the concept for, for a bridge, which could be the iconic feature. So that's a separate vote. So. This still is including what they proposed down there on the east end. Or there's south no, end, there's no river lights. There's no Ferris wheel included with this design. I know, no. but they're going to include some sort of mist on you, uh, you know, some wall or something. We have, we have the uh, fountain, interactive fountain, uh, but we do not have the, the lights that go, that go with it that were proposed at one time. So they're, they want more, they're going to want money for that besides? Depending on what we move forward for, we move forward with. Otherwise, we have the the bridge concept to uh, entertain as, as the next item. If that ends up being the iconic feature for the park, because there's so much uncertainty on under what the iconic feature should be. Uh, last time we had a discussion, there was there was some support for the bridge, and so we brought that forward to, for today's meeting. And this is just for design, or is it for construction and, and everything? Inspection too is. Design and inspection. It's plenty of money for yes. that phase. It's right. a lot of money. So, especially when they've spent, we've given them so much conceptual money. We're basically paying for that again now. Is what it amounts to. Paying for the difference. Yeah. Well, paying for the difference. I'll, I'll move a lot of 19. money for that phase. Did somebody make a motion? No. Somebody make a motion, please. I, I moved it. Is there a second? And I, I second it. Waters. Okay, call the roll, please. Moore? Aye. Shaner? Aye. Scott? No. Waters? Aye. Gretkin? Aye. 20 is resolution approving amendment number eight to the consulting and services agreement with Smith Group for the pedestrian bridge concept for the Chris Larson Park Riverfront Development Project. Tell me, want to move that? I'll move that one. Second. And is there any funding out there? Have we found any, like a Tiger Grant? Uh, as a part of their con as a part of their, their design, um, uh, as a part of this phase, they are going to research the funding sources for this particular concept. Okay. Call the roll, please. Mayor. Yeah. Oh, can I make a comment before you vote? Yep. I, I I'm going to vote no, and I and I'll tell you why. Looking at the uh, funding for this uh, development project, phase one seems to be good, not a problem. Phase two is not yet fully funded. And if we put in a pedestrian walkway, nobody knows right now, but I think we're the, the cost but I do think we're talking multi-millions in order to accomplish that. And I just have a very challenging time trying to convince myself that we should spend $59,000 now when we don't have enough money to fully fund phase two, and we sure don't have any money to fully fund a potentially $10 million pedestrian walkway. So I am going to vote no, and, and I... I hate to see the money spent uh, without having uh, the funding to go along with whatever uh, the feasibility study may tell us. 
Well, Pete, that's one of the problems I had with 19 is I, I said from the very beginning, we don't have enough parking there. And these consultants basically said, you don't know what you're talking about. Now, as part of that, uh, that number seven, you're looking at more parking across the interstate. And, I, and we were told we didn't need more parking, but now all of a sudden we don't have enough parking. So I think, I think you're going to find you got more. Yeah, I understand, what, I understand exactly what you're saying, Mayor. You're talking about amendment number seven? Yes. Number 19? Yes. Yep. I questioned that parking from the very beginning when they put out those conceptual plans, and they basically said there's plenty of parking for what you need to do there. If there was plenty of parking, why, are, why is, as part of that, are we looking at more parking? I, Makes no yeah. sense. But anyway. I don't know how we can be fiscally responsible and approve projects or even in this case, uh, a study, a consultant study, when we know right now we don't have enough money to accomplish that, that could be a five to 10 year commitment to get that far. It just doesn't make any sense until we know we have funding available. Well, Pete, I, Pete, I would tell you, if I, just, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Julie, I apologize. Um, I would just hop in and just say that I, I have heard there's a great deal of momentum for the pedestrian bridge, and before you can even look into, because I agree with the mayor, whether it's you look into a build grant, um, formerly Tiger, or you look at different funding sources, grant opportunities at the federal, the state level, et cetera, um, you have to know what it's going to cost and what that concept could look like. And so if we don't have any plans or specs, if no one's done any of that calculation, then we're really just shooting in the dark. And if we say, because I agree, there are some iconic features that I've been a fan of and others that I haven't, but this one at least has the potential where you can utilize federal dollars as well as Nebraska state dollars and Iowa state dollars, because if we're connecting to the South Sioux City recreational area where you have soccer field, tennis complex, trails, everything like that, it's a natural fit going from one recreation center to another um, that I think that there would be a lot more funds that would open up that would cover that cost that you're concerned about. Whereas if we do an iconic feature, one that's already been talked about um, or other options maybe, then you're just looking at some federal dollars, Iowa dollars specifically, no collaboration um, between two states and two communities and maybe you can help offset some of that cost. I think there was enough of an appetite for the possibility of a pedestrian bridge that would really warrant the legwork of just saying, let's at least know what we're dealing with. What would it cost? What could it look like? And where could we get that money available, which is also in this contract? Alex, I understand what you're saying, uh, and maybe it would be easier to, uh, f for me to vote for it if I knew that there was a funding source that was available or the opportunities that existed. However, I don't remember a, what I would call a serious conversation about adding this to the development project, the Riverfront Development Project. I, I know um, one of the last meetings before we uh, began staying at home, uh, I know Julie mentioned it. I'm pretty sure you uh, expressed some excitement about it. I don't remember council having a, a discussion about moving forward with this until I saw this item on the agenda. And again, if I was aware that the state of Nebraska, that the city of South Sioux was going to participate, that the federal government had funding available, but I've seen nothing along that line. And a lot of what we're doing to finish phase two is private contributions. And I'm a little, you obviously know more than I do. And I haven't heard a lot about, uh, you know, the local community being excited about the pedestrian bridge uh, as a possibility. But, but if we have to get out and start soliciting or, or 
or trying to come up with private contributions, I think it's going to be a hard sale. And I, and I wish I had some of that other information available you just talked about. Well, this is Dan. I mean, somewhat to Pete's point, and I'd, I'd like to get Matt's input on Mr. Gretkin's um, input that he had as well as Alex's, but, but maybe we haven't really um, ha have done the community type study to know what that iconic feature is. A lot of really good ideas have been uh, put on the table, but they, you know, the Ferris wheel was probably the most, uh, had the most comments of any of them. Uh, there were other ones with the lighting, the waterfall, that kind of thing. The mayor goes back uh, pretty much consistently saying who's going to, what iconic feature is going to pull people off the interstate to stop in Sioux City, spend some money, and spend some time there. And so maybe we, maybe we don't have that, and, I, and I'd like to get Matt's uh, input on this, but Matt, maybe we don't have that yet as a committee, a Riverfront Development Committee, of what that really is going to be, and do we really have the community backing for it, notwithstanding what it's going to cost. I mean, you can't, if you eliminate it, uh, to Alex's point, if you eliminate it just because of the cost, you're eliminating any avenues that you might have for grants that could be available, and maybe it is a five to ten year project, but nonetheless, it's still a project that we could all get behind as a community. Dan, this is Matt. I'll address that. Um, one of the issues with this particular item, uh, the concept, uh, what the iconic feature is going to be, is the park board split, the Riverfront Steering Committee split, the council split. Uh, when we did our public input, we had a lot of support for the Ferris wheel, but that was at the beginning stages, and there's differing opinions. So this is a difficult one to to try to figure out. And we don't have to decide right now, but um, wanted to bring it up today since we're voting on everything else. Well, I, I was going to ask you, Matt, if this is an item that could be deferred or tabled or even pulled until we, we have a steering committee meeting to just maybe get some direction of how do you how do you collect this community input that we need and that's why we separated this out from the rest of the phase two design so this could decision could be made independently so we can definitely do that and you support that from all that you've seen with the steering committee and because we've got a great steering committee folks who really do notwithstanding you know exclude me from the company on that but we've got a good steering committee and and they they work hard at it, but so you. Well, can, and that would be. Sorry. Well, you could support you that. Answer. I could support. I could support delaying that decision until the Riverfront Steering Committee's had more time to discuss the item. Because that would be my concern or question is, gosh, I feel I feel like we've solicited a lot of public opinion, and I know the I Riverfront Steering that. Committee has been has been working on this for four years. For four years, the Riverfront Steering Committee has been meeting on this and discussing features. To my knowledge, no, and I know quite a few of those people on that committee, and I mean, obviously, Dan, you and I have had conversations. I would say the only reason the pedestrian bridge ever was a no, or like, well, I don't think we can, was because we thought the cost would be, um, be too great. And so everyone loved that idea and wanted that, and there, I think there was a lot of public support, but then we just thought the cost. What I like about this is I just want to know what that number is. If it's 10 million, tell me it's 10 million, and let's go forward. And if that's what people want, let's do it. Let's see where those funds are available because I've talked with delegation here in Iowa. They believe there are grants available. I know that South Sioux City gets a great deal of grants, especially when it comes to recreation areas. I just wonder if that would be an iconic feature that could get me behind. I think what I've seen from especially the comments posts and or you know the surveys and things that are done, you're getting too many cooks in the kitchen. <laughs> and that's probably a metaphor that Julie would like. But um, I think it's one of those things that you just get too many people's opinion. How are you ever going to truly have consensus? Yes, and I'd like to add that without having a complete package to present 
either to the steering committee or to the public or to both, we're right back to square one again, saying, using assumptions, it's going to be too expensive where we won't be able to get the money. The 59000 that we're putting out for the consultant is going to include the consultant uh, giving us sources or steering us towards sources to help us fund this. Isn't that something we should be able to determine without having to pay $59,000 to have someone tell us there are grants available? Here's, here's another well, one. Well, they're really designing is. it, too, as well, Pete. It's not just for finding the funds. Well, that's design work. Why would, you, why would you, we design something that we don't even know we can afford? That's not design work. Because we don't know how much it's going to cost unless we design it first. That's not design work. That, that includes no design. That's a conceptual, but basically it's a conceptual, find your funding and get a preliminary cost estimate of what it would take. That's all you're going to get. I mean, not that that's not important, but that's all you're getting. You're going to be spending another million bucks or whatever if it's a $10 million project to design. But it's coming up. I mean, here's that is design and concept, or design and engineering. Design and engineering services. Not for 59 grand, you're not gonna. And Matt's acknowledging that. He's, he's, it's a conceptual deal only guy. I mean, I'm not saying that's a bad deal. I'm just telling you that you're not getting what you think you're getting if you think you're getting design. Right, I, I'm not saying that it's going to be detailed down to the construction design, but we don't know right. what it's going to cost them to get a concept of a design. Right, yeah, that's what, that's what you're We're still get. operating under assumptions. Yep. This is Matt again. The mayor is correct. This is just a concept. This would determine what permitting would be needed. This would start the conversation mm -hmm. with the city of South Sioux City. It would determine uh, what funding parameters are available um, and, and, real, and working with the steering committee and the park board uh, on, the, on the whole process. See, and, and I, I wish I could speak uh, with more authority on the topic. I, I don't know what the cost of a pedestrian bridge across the Missouri would be, I'm guessing, multi-million dollar expense. But at the same time, if, look how, Alex, you, you mentioned the, no, the number of years we've been working on the riverfront uh, development project. Uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, projects that are expensive like this take long periods of time. Uh, we, we talked about an aquatic center since I've been on council, and we've never gotten very far on that simply because the estimated cost was, I know, over $10 million. And what worries me is I think the Parks and Recreation Department, in particular in the amenities that are now available in the city, have been, you know, it's been a great four or five year run. and. And I don't want to see competition for them with continuing to build upon our successes in, in the community and, and have to just continue to save and, and wait five or six years or more for something we don't even know if we can afford. The Bob Carey Bridge costs $22 million and we'll be about a little over, you won't be a third, but you'll be, yeah, about half. And that was dollars back in 2016. Oh, wow. So you're looking at 10 or 11 million bucks. You won't be have to be as high either, but, because you don't have navigation up that far. But. And as an example too, that was almost exclusively federally funded, or was it federal dollars, right? 18 million. Yeah. Well, Matt, can we do that? Do we have the capability of doing the funding sources internally? We've identified, but not if you don't have a. We've, aden pay. we've identified fund, but right. we some. Don't know how many dollars we need? We've identified some, but um, we need multiple fun funding sources. So we need to see what other programs are out there. We know enough can to. Can you start do that without having a dollar amount? What's that? 
Can you find out what other funding sources there are without having uh, a dollar amount, an estimate? Yes, we can. We can start there if needed. Well, and I guess we just need to ask ourselves, Pete and Dan, you know, are you more comfortable spending this than if, if Matt comes back to you with a list of 10 grants or 10 revenue streams, does that change your mind? You know what I mean? If he comes back next week with a list and says, here are 10 grants, you know, five federal, four federal or something, and the rest state or local, you know, is that going to push your, you over the edge that you're like, okay, yeah, let's design and know what we're working with? Well, I think, or, Alex, that's a good question. I, I think I'm leaning the other way, by the way, but, but uh, we don't lose that much time by having those funding sources available. I think Pete's raising a good question that could be answered within a relatively short period of time. I, don't, I know we don't meet a week from today because of Memorial Day, but we are meeting June 1st and, and each Monday in, in June. So if it doesn't, you know, if we don't put a lot of time behind us to come up with those, I, I think it would probably be, it'd be a good decision to gather that information first. This is Matt. I would ask that the item be deferred till the second meeting in June, and then we can work on getting a list of potential funding sources for the council. So June 8th? Yes. I'll move, I'll move that, Mayor, if it's, Appropriate to move to table until June set or June eighth. There a second. I'll second it. Call the roll, please. Jayner. No. Scott. Aye. Waters. No. Gretkin. Aye. Moore. Aye. 21 is a resolution authorizing Parks and Rec to submit a grant application to the Wellmark Foundation for Outdoor fit, fit, Fitness Equipment for the Chris Larson Park River Development Project. I'll move it. Second. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Scott. Aye. Waters. Aye. Gretkin. Aye. Moore. Aye. Janer. Aye. 22 is a resolution awarding a purchase order to ExoFit Outdoor Fitness for outdoor fitness equipment for the Chris Larson Park Riverfront Development Project. I'll move it. Second. Waters? Aye. Gretkin? Aye. Moore? Aye. Shaner? Aye. Scott? Aye. 23 is a resolution approving a contract to ABC Abatement Company for the asbestos abatement at 909 Jackson Street. We get everything done on this? Uh, yes, uh, Councilman Moore had a couple questions. Uh, the entity is a Nebraska domestic corporation. We updated the contract to reflect that. Uh, there was an existing Iowa law provision in the contract, but we struck that and we added another article for jurisdiction and venue to be in Woodbury County District Court. And that was executed uh, by the contractor today, um, and it, everything should be ready to go. That. Second. Thanks, Nicole, for doing that. Gretkin? Aye. Moore? Aye. Janer? Aye. Scott? Aye. Waters? Aye. Any citizen concerns? Council concerns? Pete? <laughs> I would like to make a little statement, if I could, please. Mm -hmm. uh, today, I just want to follow up on a post that I put on my Facebook page. And <clears throat> what I mentioned was I took a few moments today to follow up on the Siouxland Recovery Fund. And this fund is uh, managed by United Way of Siouxland, and it provides financial resources that help meet the many needs for recovery in our Siouxland area for uh, when major disasters strike. Our major disaster, of course, is the COVID-19, and our disaster officially struck us on March 19th. Um, that's when this fund was activated, and I just want to thank United Way for managing this fund and to seeing that so many worthwhile entities that are reaching out um, from churches to food banks to food pantries um, to just tons of good, strong, 
public assistance, um, homeless shelters, Boys and Girls Club, there's so many to mention. Uh, it meets the direct assistance needs um, for Siouxland. And I want to say a personal thank you um, for all the hard work uh, that goes into managing that and to the entities who are, you know, servicing Siouxland for that. Okay. You can go to United Way's website if you'd like to learn more about who's receiving the grant and also if you'd like to make a donation to it. We have a citizen that phoned in that we'll take next. Yep. Good afternoon. You are on live with the City Council. If you could state your name and address for the record. Uh, Michael Brandhagen, 1423 West 4th Street. All right. Iowa. Thank you. Uh, please proceed. The Council can hear you. Okay. Um, are you ready? Yes. Okay, my uh, concern was I uh, just uh, wanted to know if there was any plans on putting a uh, sidewalk for pedestrian safety on Hamilton Boulevard to the Chris Larson Park. I don't know the answer to that. We'll have to get you an answer. What, what was the question, Mayor? Or Is there someone can... plans to put a Hamil on Hamilton Boulevard down to Chris Larson Park? And I don't know, I thought there was sidewalks under that new bridge, but maybe there isn't. I guess I haven't. There is no sidewalks from Triview um, down to the park, and uh, you kind of have to walk on the shoulder to get to the entrance. Okay, well, let, let's get your phone number and we'll try to get you an answer, okay? You got his phone number? Yes. Okay, we'll try to get you, we'll have the parks director call you, okay? Okay? Mr. Brennan. Okay. Were you able to hear the mayor? We uh, will have someone contact you with the telephone number that you provided to the city clerk. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Pete, do you have anything? No, I do not, Mayor, thank you. Dan? Uh, just everyone have a safe Memorial Day weekend next weekend, Memorial Day being on Monday. Please stay safe. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Yep, you're welcome. You too. Thank you. Alex? Yeah, I just wanted to say a couple things, and uh, bear with me. I have a fire alarm going off right now. Uh, apparently my mom's cooking is something great. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to it. Uh, oh, there, it went off. It went off. We're, we might be ordering from Soho. Uh, I hope you're okay. Yeah, no, we're good. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things. Number one, I would really ask our um, our citizens, uh, citizens of Siouxland just to practice some patience. Um, as businesses start opening, um, as they feel comfortable, and um, if they're requiring masks or whatever safety protocols and uh, procedures that they're implementing, I would ask that you just practice patience and good character. I've heard of numerous times now where individuals are going into businesses that require masks or are trying to do so to keep their staff safe and have been verbally assaulted. Um, I just I don't think there's any any need for that in our community, and we need to um, practice better judgment. That a lot of these employers see that that they're trying to just protect their employees and make sure that they're not getting sick. So um, please respect those businesses. Um, and, and practice some patience as we all go through this reopening process. Um, and then the other thing that I would just mention, we did have some exciting news um, for Sioux City. I think it's pretty exciting that NAIA basketball uh, was extended an additional year, so we'll be hosting that championship through 2025, as well as NAIA volleyball, um, which is being extended through 2024. And so, and so I'm really excited about um, those two extensions, both the volleyball as well as basketball. Um, and then finally, too, the Courtyard by Marriott Hotel opened up. Um, I'm sure it was a, a lot less uh, of an exciting opening than they were hoping for, but um, I'm looking forward to getting back to business and seeing the continued development of our downtown. That's all I have, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Thanks, hey, Alex. Hey, Bob, our church bought a fogger. I would like you to look into one of those just if we could afford one they must not be terribly expensive but they're a machine fogger 
I think we have two or three on order already. Okay, good. Because I it appears that they work, and within ten seconds, your your room's ready to go again. So I think we need that for here and for the convention center, and maybe even for the Tyson for, to look at that. Then uh, I have a little deal to read. The city of Sioux City will continue to monitor the impact of COVID-19 in our community and do what we can to protect our citizens. We'll follow guidelines established by the state of Iowa and open our public facilities when we feel it is appropriate time for, for our city. At this time, city facilities will remain closed until further notice. Normally, we would open the swimming pools in time for the Memorial Day weekend. However, we're unable to open them at this time. The governor's proclamation prohibits all swimming pools from opening until at least May 27th. In addition, we follow the Center for Disease Control guidelines and may not be, open to, be able to open the swimming pools at all this summer. We're currently assessing the ability to offer limited service of the pool, which I don't think would be right under these circumstances, but the staff is still looking at swimming lessons and other small private group activities, which can meet the CDC guidelines. We, we hope to have an announcement soon. Thank you for understanding. With that, I move we adjourn. Second. Brecken. Aye. Moore. Aye. Shaner. Aye. Scott. Aye. Waters. Aye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yep, thank, thank you. Everybody have a good holiday.